You are now listening to the sounds of Milk Crates and Microphones. Joining us now, a Milk Crates and Microphones exclusive. It is our Halloween special, so we had to bring someone a little extra spooky. He came from that horrorcore scene, took some time off, and he came back recently with a new album, Pineapple. You know him as Low Key FKA. It's Low Key Excelsior. Hell yeah. What's up, bro? What up, brother? Fucking so glad to have you here, man. I appreciate you even showing Thanks up. Thanks for us. joining us Hell tonight, yeah. brother. We appreciate you. All good. Hell All yeah. All good. A little bit last minute, but I'm here. We appreciate you being here last minute, too. Hell yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your your how you came up in music because it's it's got to be an interesting story. Uh, and because I think when we first caught you, you came on the map with that sick maid and we saw you and now eat and doing all that shit. Can you give us a little backstory how you got into that scene and got uh, hooked up with uh, the sick maid crew, Brother Lynch Hung and all those dudes? Yeah, yeah. I um I got into hip hop when I was a kid in Hawaii. Right. And uh, we were far removed from the mainland at the time. So what I knew was very limited. And then when I hit Sacramento, I had greater access. Like the original OGs that influenced me would have been KRS-One with Boogie Down Productions, Ice-T, um, NWA, and Public Enemy. So oh, I started off being a pop locker and then I got into the rap. And when I started getting serious about it, I had a DJ, DJ Time Bomb, and we had this little crew um, the first time I went into a studio to record, it was at a studio that knew how to do rock music. And I was like, this ain't it. And I had heard that Lynch was engineering at Enharmonic, which if, if you know any of the Sacramento hip hop history, that's like the iconic place where uh, Season of the Sickness was done, X-rated's first album. So I hooked up with him and we just started vibing off of each other. And, uh, and then... Eventually, like I was there when he was writing, uh, you know, Season of the Sickness. Oh, shit. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and and it was it, it was this time where I think none of us knew how iconic this shit was going to be. Right. Like this is this is before there were, you know, quarter million dollar uh, budgets to do like music videos. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we were, we were that generation that came first for the love of it and then understood later on that you could make a living out of this. Like this could be a life, you know what I'm saying? And so I was there when uh, Lynch Hung was writing season of the sick. Uh, I used to get collect calls from X when he was locked up prior to conviction. Uh, and he would, you know, he would, he would call us up collect. I'd answer the call and he'd start rapping songs that later on appeared on unforgiven. <laughs> and, I kind of knew at the time, like, I'm hearing history here in the making. Yeah. The funny thing is, is you only had 15 minutes and then you had to hang up and call back. And when we got the phone bill for all those collect calls, <laughs> it was like, oh, no, we, we're going to have to stall out that. But for a minute, I was getting <laughs> collect calls from X and he would just start rapping. So we we didn't know what we were about to to. We, you know, we had an idea. But once season of the sick hit, shit felt real. And then when uh, that's what I said, the song that you know blew me up, that got me the exposure with me and Lynch hung, uh, that was on Masterpiece's West Coast Bad Boys Two, which was dedicated to Pac post uh, posthumously. It's the one that had the West Side being thrown up with all the diamonds on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. was a compilation, like compilations. It was compilations, and then those became mixtapes, and then those, now we have playlists. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. So that's the one that blew us up, that blew me up. Lynch already had his name going, that blew me up. I remember uh, Dave Weiner calling me up from Priority after that song hit, and he was like, are you and Lynch ready to be the ebony and ivory of gangster rap? Damn, that's <laughs> fucking awesome. Wow. That's some big shoes to yeah. fill right off the gate. Yeah, and then uh, in the mail came the gold plaque because uh, West Coast Bad Boys 2 went gold. And that was the moment when I realized, oh, this shit is serious. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Loki, how how did you guys link up with uh, Master P and the No Limit 
uh, record crew and kind of get onto that album that Master P put out because that album was a dedication to Tupac. It was a, it featured a lot of West Coast legends for sure. But how did you guys go about making that connection and getting onto that album? I would have to say it was probably because of uh, us being on priority. Like Black Market had distro through Priority. Okay. Priority was also distributing Master P and No Limit. So that was probably the nexus that connected us beyond already Lynch's name was starting to ring. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people associate Master P almost exclusively as being a Southern rapper, but he had spent some time in the Bay Area. And so he was aware of what the West Coast was doing. He just put his feet down in the South, and that's obviously where he blew up and he made his money. Yeah, got it. That's that's amazing, man. That's an amazing story. That album, uh, I want to say, it was number eight off the Billboard 200. Like it was, it, it was did really well for a yeah. compilation. Yeah. Tells yeah. you what the times were like because compilation yeah. at the time was that, like you said, that was the shit right there. That was that was how you heard everybody. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this: stepping back to that's what I said when when you were making that. Did you have any idea of the impact it was going to have, or like you were like, man, this right here is is doing something? Or you're just like, this is another good track that I'm going to put in the collection. Yeah, it was. Um, I wrote my verse, <clears throat> and um, I spit it for a couple of the homies, and uh, this was at what later would be known as the Sick Made House on the Loaded album. Um, and I spit it for a couple of the homies and one of them was like, you need to record that right the fuck now. So like, here's the thing, man. We, we knew we had talent. We knew we had something and Sacramento, the tradition of bars in Sacramento, like that's a high premium. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, with the rapid fire flow and you know, when you write 16 bars, of rap, that's like dense storytelling. There's a lot going on. It's not like 16 bars of R&B or anything else. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And we also came from a real grimy background where escalation was kind of par for the course, right? So with us, if you bring a gun to a fight, we're going to eat your babies. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, that was the mentality. And so, uh, you know, of course, that would would eventually accrue into a lot of other negative shit that happened in, in my life and other, some of my peers, you know, the, the, the bar that we set lyrically and then the lives that we were living, mm -hmm. they were very, they, they very much intersected. Mm. And the thing about, uh, um, both the music industry and where we were coming from, like, first of all, you have a bunch of young men who for the most part don't have positive uh, male role models in our lives, right? A lot of us had single mothers, myself included. Then you bring in being economically deprived, uh, living in food deserts, shitty education, right? So that's another kind of strike against us. Um, and then you bring in that we're kind of getting into, into the music industry, where if you're a successful musician at any level, you're afforded a lot of leeway. Like there's a lot of idolatry and like you can't do anything wrong. So we had, and I'll speak more personally for myself, not, not, not for some of my peers, but we were in an environment we were, where we were encouraged to wild out, where there were no real sense of like uh, decorum, you know what I mean, uh -huh. or, or consequences. I mean, the consequences on the street were real, but once you start you know, moving into the music industry, it's a whole different game. I remember a while back, Lynch Hunt, Lynch was, uh, uh, he said in an interview, uh, they had gone to an industry party down in LA. I didn't go to that one. And one of the homies, one of the OGs from the block, pulled him aside and said, hey man, you know, seeing this party, this was like an industry party on like a movie lot. Like it was a lot of money, a lot of beautiful people, a lot of like impressive shit to you know kids from the street from sacramento and one of the ogs pulled him aside and he was like man you really got to pursue the music you know like there has to be at some point a separation of the streets from the music mm -hmm. and he took that to heart and you know i i i got that impression from him and i was aware at that point that there had to be kind of a line there and uh after loaded no actually prior to loaded we went down to la and we got Ice T on a couple of songs. Yeah. And this is like one of my idols, right? Oh, yeah. 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 And, and we go to meet him up in the Hollywood Hills. He had this 
fallen ass mansion. Um, you know, I won't say everything about like, but it was fucking phenomenal. And he also said he like he he took some time. He get he gave Lynch the verses for free. First of all, damn wow. And, and yeah, and he took some time to sit there with us and break down for us what it is to be in the game. Uh. And he also said you need to separate the homies from the business. Yeah. He recognized the homies that got that acumen that that you can pull with you, but there's got to be that separation. And you know, over the last couple of years, with a lot of the the new younger rappers coming into the game and getting iced out, mm. um, you know, there's some of that we're going to stay where we came from and there has to be some kind of separation of that. You know what I mean? Um, like <laughs> one of my friends who's really not from that life came to me recently and they were like, why are all of these rappers suddenly dying? <laughs> you know? And I was like, it's not that all of a sudden more rappers are dying. It's that more street kids are rapping. Yeah. Like yeah. that has always been going on that, that body count. That's nothing new. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just so happens they're rappers now. Exactly. Like everybody and their fucking grandma wants to get a laptop, download Reason mm -hmm. or Fruit Loops, yeah. whatever. You know what I mean? Wrap in their closet and all of a sudden they're out. Yeah. Because when you are you now, when you're coming up is the mid 90s, mid to late 90s. And you're having to go to studios where you're having to pay time or you're lucky enough to get time and record on you know you know high tech shit for what it is at that time but it has right. it's not even close to what we have nowadays like you said i mean you can have that same studio on a laptop in your garage it's gotta have a yeah good mic, yeah. yeah my my first record illegitimati was recorded on two inch reel to reel oh, wow. i still have the reels oh, they weigh a fucking ton i've been carrying them around with me for decades <laughs> That's now insane. Uh, at some point gonna you know do some remastering on that but from that to what we do now on a laptop and all of the um, the filters that you can open up inside, you know, any DAW system like Ableton or mm. Reason and hit a couple buttons and it's mixed and mastered. Like it's wildly, wildly different. Yeah. That's amazing. Also, the story with Ice-T and like you being able to get advice at a young age from one of the legendary businessmen that was in hip hop. Somebody that did business like at a top tier level of a businessman yep. and to get that advice, like you said, coming from Sacramento, a lot of people think of Sacramento as it's the capital. It's the, this, this nice, pretty city, but you know, obviously you've seen the other side of Sacramento. Talk a little bit about that life in Sacramento and it's still going on to this day, but it, you know, it, it was pretty yeah. heavy in the nineties as well. Yeah, it's, it's still going on. Um, and I don't think that'll ever change. Mm. Um, we lost one of the homies last year. Mm. When it's 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 no level of small irony that Sacramento finally gets a mass shooting and it's still gang related. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I had a couple of people there that night, a couple of my 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 people and one of the homies died that night. And like three months prior to that, I was in Vegas chilling with him and a couple of the other boys watching shitty stoner movies and seeing him with his girlfriend, and they had the most loving, beautiful relationship. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's I, I mean, it's horrible. To go from that, to see that, and then a couple months later, mm -hmm. gone, is, um, you know, it's kind of same as it ever was. Yeah. And at my point, being an elder and, and being far removed from that for quite some time now, I can't speak to the specifics of it, but it's clear to me that not a lot has changed. Mm. And... Uh, you know, the older I get, the more I realize that my expectations for a better tomorrow, uh, I can't really rely on the rest of the world to to deliver that. It's something that we got to do ourselves. Yes. And, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's facts yeah. right there. It's real facts. Loki, you've always you've always uh, been a, an artist who stood out, especially with the sick made crew, uh, a guy who was more conscious, had kind of that hip hop sound. It wasn't always about uh, eating babies and, and killing people, eating guts. You had more, you were a great storyteller. Um, where did that Thank come you. from? Did that come from just your love from the hip hop genre and that kind of conscious style that you were exposed to previously? I think, um, well, coming, yeah, coming from like, like when hip hop first really started to, to be heard, there was a lot of political awareness in there as well as the street shit. Mm -hmm. 
and they weren't necessarily divided. It always pissed me off later on when I'd be hanging out with like backpack rappers and they'd be like, this is real hip hop, as if to say that gangster rap wasn't For sure. or trap music wasn't. Mm. And I'm not a fan of that mentality. Mm. I understand where they're coming from. And the necessity now for bringing some consciousness and some positivity into it is more important than ever. And I definitely tried to, like with Illegitimate, my first album, you can hear I'm, I'm hitting different genres, I'm hitting different notes, yeah. instead of just being a bunch of like, and I'm going to eat your babies. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Which is, you know, that's like, you, you got to understand, well, like there was so much fucking talent that came through Sick Made. Um, I, I, I think it was reasonable for us to think the world was going to discover our talent and and reward us with it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But we had no mentors. Uh, you know what? What little leadership we had coming from black market, even black market. And and said and all of them were dealing with a lot of limited information and still that kind of small town men mentality, right? Mm -hmm. Like if we had been in LA, I'm sure we would have been getting endorsement deals. There would have been stewardship that would have led us into different, you know, into understanding the business end of it better. Uh -huh. But we were just a bunch of you know wilding out kids from Sacramento. Yeah. And so, like for me, uh, I'd always been a writer. Like I, I used to draw comic books when I was a kid and I got them published in this one Hawaiian newspaper uh, at, at one point. And uh, I would start writing, you know, like in eighth grade, I wrote a short story that that kind of my my teacher pulled me aside and he was like, you need to continue with this. So I'd always been telling stories. And then when I got into writing rap. That was that was the best education I've ever had in terms of the craft of storytelling and rapping. Uh, especially because I would like my peers were bad motherfuckers. Mm. So you had to come with it. Hell you yeah. had to have that. And, um, you know, that that period of time writing and, and producing and making albums was a phenomenal education. And like later on, I wrote a novel. Uh, I've written a couple of screenplays. I'm I'm one of those people that's hopelessly compelled to create. It's mm. kind of a gift and a curse. It's the, the way in which it's a curse is I'm real good at making the art and I'm still trying to figure out the business end of it, how to monetize it, how to be, you know, how to make a living doing it mm. on the in, in the long term and how to build wealth off of it. But I I'm constantly writing shit, whether it's poems, screenplays, rap, um, you know, bandanas, the posters, yeah, yeah. Visual shit like it's it's nonstop for me. You're it's, it's an so, art form. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, like getting into writing rap and being a being a being a lyricist, that dialed it in for me. Yeah. We we being being somewhat local to Sacramento and hearing the music, we always looked up to that music and thought that it was being heard everywhere and we thought yeah. everybody knew who the fuck Sick made the Sick Made cast was just because like you said, they're some bad motherfuckers. And it was easy to tell when you would listen to other music i don't have to say any names but when you're hearing other music you're like no these guys are better why are they getting paid and yet when we talk to people on the east coast it was like no we don't know who this is or you know what i'm saying it's like that that message didn't get spread well uh do you know how that happened or w was there a drop of the ball somewhere on the on the marketing side so there's a couple things that happen um horrorcore and acid rap were kind of the same thing you had Esham and those guys, Triple Six Mafia in Detroit. Uh, you had the Grave Diggers on the East Coast, mm -hmm. but that was like a real high value production, uh, and and that to me doesn't really embody what horrorcore really was. Oh no, yeah. And for then sure. you had us in Sacramento, and and the legend has it is that Wendy Day, um, if y'all don't know who she is, she's she's one of those like hidden figures in hip hop that has been instrumental in. Um, in guiding a lot of people towards success and kind of being a tastemaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, the way I heard it was she was looking at Kansas City and Sacramento in terms of where should she put her attention on and like really put some energy into. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, she she picked Kansas City and we've seen what's happened with Strange Music mm -hmm. and, and Tech Nine since, mm -hmm. and they deserve it. Yeah. Um, at the same time, I think Sacramento you know, we were, we were pretty fucking ignorant <laughs> and 
And I could see if you're doing an analysis, looking at the wild and out shit that was going on. And, you know, there were all these notorious murders that kept happening. Like people were getting capped. It was just, I could see looking at that going, I don't know if we're going to be able to make this work. And, you know, eventually for me, uh, you know, after a while, I wasn't making any money at it. Um, I'd lost some really close people to both overdoses and, and being killed. Um, and it just felt like, and I had a kid, I had a son and that'll radically fucking rewrite your shit real quick. And so eventually I just kind of, I hung up the mic, tucked up, tucked away the pistol, moved down to San Diego, was a dad to my kid for many years of which I have zero regrets. Hmm. I'm very proud of that kid. Now he's off at a university in Tokyo. And now, um, now I have the the time and the opportunity again to get back into the music, and that's what I'm doing with the new album, Pineapple. Hell yeah! Is that how that that motivated you and that sparked that that uh, creation, that new album? Is just having more time on your hands. It's interesting. Uh, my creative partner, Tragic, um, he uh, he hit me up about six years ago, and uh, he was like, "I want to, you know, get a verse from you." And that conversation turned into, I want a whole song. And so I hadn't really written anything in probably five or six years. Mm -hmm. Not like a full song. Like constantly I'll be driving down the freeway and I'll see a billboard in a word and I'll start thinking about the mm -hmm. pattern, right? You know, how many syllables, all that shit. Like that's a constant engine in my brain. But I hadn't really, like I was so removed from that. I pulled up my pants, went and got a job at a corporation doing graphic design uh, fell into a relationship that, you know, where I was like, oh, I'm going to grow old with this person. Like there were all of these things that pulled me away from that. Mm -hmm. And the homie tragic hit me up and he's like, I want to get a song from you. And so near the end of me writing it, he wanted to come down to, to Cali to be there for the recording of it. And I didn't feel like the facilities that I knew about in San Diego were up to par. And he had one in Toronto that was. So I flew up there. We dropped it. Um, that's the song Mutiny off the new Pineapple album. It's hard. And say what? It's, that's a dope ass track. Mutiny is a super hard, hard track, man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I cycle through my favorite songs on the album, but that's, that, that's one that I keep coming back to. So we did Mutiny. That was about five years ago. We sat around. I went out to Vegas for a minute, um, to, to work on the, uh, the Blockstar Evolution label with X rated. I had, at the same time, all the guardrails that were in my life that was keeping me focused were gone. Son was off to uh, university. I'd moved. I, I'd help moms move up north, and um, and I go to Vegas, and my drinking problem became a fucking problem. Mm -hmm. And so I had to pull out. I had to. I had to get the fuck out. Um, I've written about it. I, I had a, a, a memoir piece published last year in a literary journal that that very well describes what what i went through but it was a long-term downward spiral and i'd come to the end of it like i was living with one foot in the grave and one foot on the gas pedal hmm. all gas no brakes and i was going towards that abyss and at the last minute i cranked the wheel and slammed into a wall moved up to humboldt got my shit clean got sober did a lot of personal reflection did some therapy and in that time, the homie Tragic hit me up like, you know, come up to Canada. He's up there. Let's let's work on a new album. And so it started off as an EP and we just kept on. He just kept on making like the, the thing you got to understand about Tragic. He's, he's a producer's producer. Like peop, some people make beats. I feel like he makes songs. There's mm -hmm. compositional shit happening. You'll hear strings near the end of the song that aren't in the beginning. Like he understands the tension, mm -hmm. how to build it up, how to, you know, all of that yeah. shit. Uh, he, he's got some, like he went to school for some of that, but he's just got this ear. And so I went up there and we recorded a bunch of shit, came back to, to Humboldt, recorded a bunch more. And the next thing you know, we had a 16 track album. Whew. Yeah. Not, not just an album as a yeah you know, a full album a full classic uh, four, of, yeah. of an album four, as well four to five minute tracks uh, no, nobody's still, doing which, that. which yeah. which no one is really doing anymore two minutes most, it's hard to do yeah. the, the production value is excellent man i mean that's a great a great album uh comeback album, piece. yeah great comeback it's sad it took so long but it, the comeback is awesome like man you you haven't missed a step i will say uh, what was the process like 
like this album compared to Illegitimati, what was that mindset? How, how did that differ from, from this album to, you know, your very first one? That's a good question. Um, years, wisdom, life experience. Um, when I did Illegitimati, I still had all that young swagger. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, and one of my favorite quotes of all time comes from Mike Tyson. And it goes, I'm paraphrasing, but it goes, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the fucking face. Yep. So recording Illegitimati, I was in a whole different mentality. Recording Pineapple, I'd been punched in the fucking face a couple times. Mm-hmm. So I had a different perspective on it. Also, um, I'm not, you know, at this point, I'm not so quick to like squander a bar just to get a song done. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. Like, uh I don't think at this point I'm going to go into a studio on the spot and just bang it out and, and, and hit the booth mm-hmm. like that. That's rare for me now. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. Like, what do I want to say? How do I want to say it? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 And so the, the difference now is I have a little more wisdom to offer. Um, I still have, you know, a lot of shit to say. And, and finally, this is one of the, the both the blessings and the problems with how the music industry now is, is it's so it's been so kind of democratized in a way to where anyone anyone can put their shit on Spotify like the any kind of considerations about I need to write a hit or, OK, this is going to be the song about smoking weed. This is going to be the song about getting bitches. Mm-hmm. This is going to be the song about my car like that's completely oversaturated oversaturated and not even needed like there's so many like you could fucking wear a mohawk and rap about squirrels and you'll find a fucking audience right right? (laughs) you'll find your your tribe on spotify and on uh tiktok and 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 you can find your way and so now you know with making this album it was like i'm gonna say exactly what the fuck i want to say i'm not gonna feel like this needs to be this song this needs to be that And, um, you know, it just kind of came about very organically, like, especially, I'm sorry, the whole two minute song bullshit is apps. It's just fucking bullshit. Yeah, it's bullshit. And I've had quite a few people tell me as I was working on this record, well, you know, you, you got to make sure it's no longer than two minutes. And I'm like, fuck you. That ain't happening. (laughs) It's not fucking happening. And all of that, like, this is the way it is now. That constantly has always been the case. Since the beginning, it's been, this is how you do a song. And there are so many people that have successfully, like, look at Stand by Eminem. Mm -hmm. That's a five-minute fucking song with four verses. Long-ass verses. That's a story. That Mm. shit blew the fuck up. It's like one of the most, it's probably, it's at least in the top ten of, like, the best storytelling songs in hip-hop ever. Yeah. And that motherfucker has four verses, four hooks, an intro, yeah. an outro, and, and plays a bridge. two different fucking people on the fucking song. You know <laughs> what plays I mean? two different fucking people, has the right? plot twist at the end. Like, I mean, it's insane. So, you, you, like, and you know that there were people that were like, well, you know, we need like a three and a half minute song. You know, they, this like, work, there's yeah. the, the bean counters that want the bullshit so they can make the, the money. And then there's real artistry. Yes. Like uh, uh, the song Losing My Religion by R.E.M. There's this uh, show on Netflix called Song Exploder, which I highly recommend. And it's all about famous songs and how they came to be. That's like a five minute song with no real discernible moment when this is the hook and this is the verse. They played a mandolin at the beginning. Mm. It was, I think, their, fir- their fourth album. And so they had some clout where they said, this is the single. And the label was like, fuck, no, it ain't. And they were like, nah, this is the single. And that shit is iconic. That song's that sick shit, as fuck. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so for me at this point, I don't, I don't really pay attention to any of the logic around this is how it has to be done. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and Rick Rubin has said quite a few times, make the fucking music you want to hear. Because when you're true to it, People will know. People will find that. And more now than ever, I think there's a real demand from listeners for authenticity. And also, there's a demand for the elders to come back, the OGs, and bring some artistry back to it. Like, uh, you know, people from my generation, Jadakiss, Nas, they're selling out. The new kids, not so much. Mm -mm. I think, yeah, at some point that gimmick gets stale and people go back to authenticity and that's always something that sells we've known that for 
the beginning of time that realness is what's going to sell always. Um, yeah. And that's something that you guys have done for a long time. And we wanted to talk to you a little bit about before we, we let you go here. We want to talk a little bit about uh, Now Eat, making that movie. <laughs> yeah. What was that experience like? What was the budget on this film? I mean, because we, uh, we, we revered it as a great underground classic like movie we watch it all the time it's a it's a great movie to watch during halloween season you know it's a classic it's a classic for us but when you watch it i mean you're god you can't help but to laugh as well too (laughs) of course was that kind of the feeling or did you guys feel like you were making a scorsese flick (laughs) (laughs) wasn't the next a little bit of both bro like uh we had a blast making it yeah you Um, could tell that you could tell you guys were having fun which was awesome yeah yeah, and, and again, that's something that came through uh, Dave Weiner, who who was over at Priority. Um, so we got the script, and Lynch handed it to me, like, read this and tell me what you think. Mm-hmm. And I read it, and I was like, this is fucking brilliant. This is not – because everyone at that point, everyone's making – every gangster rapper is making gangster movies, right? There's about it. Like, everyone wants to be these super bad, hardcore gangsters and super tough – and, and kind of perpetuate this portrayal beyond the music. And here was this dark horror comedy that incorporated a lot of the sick made ethos, right? The cam, the, you know, yeah, yeah. the cannibalism, the gangster shit, but it was funny. It was fucking weird. Um, so the script reads great. You guys didn't and, write the script. The script came to you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they sent the script to Lynch he he read it, then he handed it to me, like, read this shit and tell me, you know, you think we should do this? And I read it, and I was like, we should absolutely do it. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And so I think we shot over 14 days. Uh, there's a bunch of episodes from that. I'm, I'm working on a memoir that's going to go into it. Um, it was a lot of fucking fun. But at the same time, once you're on set, you can see, like, oh, this, this joke is probably not going to play the way we think it is. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So for me, that movie, I feel like that movie deserves a spot on like the top 10 best worst B B movie horror movie type things. You know what I mean? Like it it has it's got some really awkward moments. It's got like like the the body parts. You can tell they're made out of rubber. You know what I mean? There's a lot of funny shit in there that wasn't necessarily our intent. Uh Oh, and and we we had started working on on a sequel, too, by the way, um, which we never did. But like that whole experience was a lot of fun, definitely an education on how movies are made. And it it definitely has endured. Like years later when I was in San Diego, my girlfriend at the time, um, we were so I was so removed from all of that. And and she heard about this movie and she was like, I have to see this. And I and I held <laughs> off for a minute, like, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> but like, I, please, baby, let me see this movie. And so I finally pulled it up and played it for her. And she fucking loved it. Yeah. She's just like, this is the best thing. And to the point, like, yeah, I, I, yeah, she would, she would bring it up at the most funny fucking times. And, uh, even, uh, I, I better not tell the whole story, but, but she would bring it up in kind of kinky situations and shit. <laughs> like it was really, that's when I was like, oh, I, I, okay, this has value beyond, you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily just like, Yes, it was very limited in how we could film. Like you can tell when we don't have the best lighting, you can see the kind of grain in the film. But it, it's something that I have no problem looking at now with a lot of you know warmth and humor. Not to mention, it was dope as fuck to go into Blockbuster and see that Hell on yeah. the new releases yeah. rack Hell yeah. when it came out in Sacramento. Hell yeah, <laughs> that that would that's that's got to be even for. Uh, a rapper it's got to be better than seeing your album in stores because everyone's got an album in stores who's got a fucking movie at blockbuster right yeah yeah plus you know it also like gives you an idea that you can move beyond just what you're doing right now like like the you know the world kind of opens up to you creatively when you start flexing those kinds of different creative muscles hey it made me go out and buy it i own it on vhs and i play it every year and it's one of my favorite uh horror movie flicks bro uh, at the 30 minute mark you guys do like a freestyle uh cypher was that Uh was that uh a a true freestyle or those written or how did that play out mine was written i can't speak for everyone else i think the first half was written and then after that i started going off the dome yeah um 
like we like we didn't have the budget to where we could film that scene for days on end yeah. <laughs> you know what i'm saying one day. so it was like i better make sure i come prepared so i can nail this we have one fucking like half an hour well no that was a couple of hours but you know we were filming at at the house that i was renting with the homie mm-hmm. for that whole party scene and that was in like the back bedroom so you've got that tiny ass little room you've got the camera crew the lights you're sweating <laughs> bullets it's fucking it's it's a sacramento summer like it was you know that kind of filmmaking where we had to really do a lot of shit on the fly you didn't want you, you didn't want to be the guy that made it take take two hours just to do this scene you got to be the guy that's like hey we're getting in and out of here guys let's get this fucking done yeah yeah and it exactly. has and it has a dope soundtrack i mean that's a good soundtrack that goes along with the movie oh, yeah. right definitely does it not we played it we played it at every party as we as we wind down here man before we let you go then the name loki loki uh, Ex- excelsior i mean i've heard you call yourself excelsior i've heard you call yourself loki bloody chuckles bro how did you get the name uh, the rap name loki excelsior or Loki. So I first became aware of Loki, the god of mischief, um, through Thor, the comic book. Mm. Everyone knows what I'm talking about yeah, now yeah. in terms yep. of Marvel and, yeah, now, uh, yeah. you know, Loki being one of the villain now mm-hmm. slash heroes of the whole franchise. And uh, I knew that I didn't want to, like, back then, in terms of your name, um, it you know let's see the like like at that time there was a lot of MC before the name, there was a lot of um, uh you know uh, aliases kind of things instead of like you know no one was going by like their real name like Kendrick Lamar mm-hmm. for example, so I was thinking about it and and I was like what am I gonna you know what am I gonna find that's gonna be uniquely outside of the paradigm, but still kind of something that I'm relevant to or or resonant with you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. and so i chose that name and of course a lot of people call me low-key like l-o-w-k-e-y you know what i mean yeah zag used to call me kilo all the time you know like like your name evolves over time Mm -hmm. anyways and so that's that's what i picked and uh excelsior smith excelsior was the signature that stanley would sign at the end of letters to fans you know stanley being the the guy that created a lot of the yeah. marvel oh, characters yeah. that we now see in movies so i took that excelsior and then smith was just kind of like a ubiquitous name i think bloody chuckles was just i don't know maybe that was inspired by fight club or something like that uh-huh. um you know and and of course we were everyone was starting to fuck around with aliases i think e40 did a good job of like making that a thing mm-hmm. you know with fonzarelli charlie and, and Cody water and all that yeah um and you know i started going by excelsior smith like when i was coming back to make pineapple i was of the mind i'm just gonna go as excelsior smith uh-huh. and wisely a lot of people were like bro you have a name stick with it yeah I did register it with ASCAP, so um, you know I, I have a legal hold to it. Um, ASCAP. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, ASCAP. Hard. Like like the old shit. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And you know now the SoundCloud and all these not SoundCloud, a uh, Sound Exchange and all these other platforms yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah. But I figured, all right, let's go with Loki Excelsior, so I can have a little bit of both. And um, and you know. I mean, you, you got to understand, like, once I left Sacramento and went down south and, you know, got a legit, like, like, for many, many years, I was in the lunatic fringe side of the underbelly where, you know, I don't recall ever just going in and getting a job. If I ever did get a job, it was the homie, it was the hookup. There were times where I wasn't, you know, making legit money. And, and so... Like when I went to San Diego, I, I fully kind of like left a lot of that shit behind. Uh-huh. Uh, Michelle Mann, rest in peace. She had been murdered. She was a real dear friend of mine. And, and I was just exhausted. Hmm. I was exhausted. I was tired. I don't know if you've seen the movie They Clone Tyrone yeah. that just came out. Yeah. It's a great fucking movie. And I feel like John Boyega should get a fucking Oscar for how well he embodies the exhaustion hmm. of being in the hood. The exhaustion of being a D-boy, the exhaustion of feeling like you have no options, you're tired. You know what I mean? I had come to a point, not to mention um, that, you know, by that point I was I was drinking. I was never like into the hard shit, um, but the drinking was certainly 
at that point it had a hold in my life right hmm. in terms of um it was it was a daily part of it i still had the guardrails in place but there was just a lot of things to where i was i was fucking tired yeah. i was done i was exhausted and i was seeing people overdose and die and go to prison and come back and go back to prison and um it was just it was it was time to let it all go and to really be there and and be a presence in my son's life mm. and so that's what i did and in in so doing you know there was a lot of growth that i got to experience and we're all works in progress so you know like by no means am i uh uh done you know like like it's funny how people talk about it's a million and one chances that you're born, that your little spermatozoa squiggles into the egg and you become a person. Mm -hmm. I also feel like it's a million to one chances as you grow up that you don't become an absolute piece of shit human being. Yeah. You know what I'm oh, saying? Like all of the different factors that went into me being where I'm at now, both good and bad, you know, there's there's so much randomness to it. Mm. It's such a it's such an uphill battle, especially even more so now with the way our society is so fractured and everyone's fucking angry at each other and everyone's, you know, digging in their heels and social media has just shattered our ability to like sit down and have a conversation or, or pay attention to something that's longer than fucking 10 seconds. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So I think in the end, um, I'm grateful to be where I'm at now and in, in returning to, being, you know, a, a creator and a musician and a rapper, uh, there's just there's this kind of newfound energy and there's this newfound sense that there's not a time limit on this. We don't have to hang it up at any certain point. You know, the the OGs and the elders are relevant again. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see ever stopping at this point. OK, yeah. I was just going to ask, is pineapple the end of an era for Loki or did this just reinvigorate or reinvigorate a that 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 creative juices and you know made you want to just keep going pineapple is the beginning i love that um yeah yeah pineapple's the beginning the next record and i've been taught i know i've been talking about this for a year right now me and tragic are already plotting it out we, we're putting together the song list um some of the beats in production uh the next album is probably going to be ghetto blaster <laughs> dope um which you know that that's been in my brain for decades probably and then I've got a bunch of EPs that I'm working on. I'm kind of collaborating with different producers on EPs. There's my boy Venezi, who was a part of uh, Blockstar Evolution in Vegas for a minute. We're doing some shit. Um, I have uh, th th this idea that what I want to do next year um, is because real quick, here's how the music, here's how people listen to music now. It's a song. Mm -hmm. It's not an album. It's not a listening experience from beginning to end. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Ice T famously was talking about this recently. No one listens to albums anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. And cohesion it's true. doesn't matter. Um, you know, we we all we we all can make our own uh, mixtape. It's now a playlist on Spotify. Right. And so that's why we dropped seven singles before the album Pineapple came out. Hmm. And I would have been down to drop a couple more, but my producer, Tragic, he's like, bro, this is a fucking listening experience we need to make people sit down for. And he's right. And so at this point, next year, what I'd like to do is drop shit back, like singles back to back. I'd like to have a continuous stream of songs coming out and then figure out how to kind of package them into these different listening experiences. Which means that I, you know, you have to really premeditate the shit. Like if I just make a song and put it out, how does that fit into the album later on? Yeah. So I don't have any exact answers on it, but that's that's what we're planning to do. Well, we're we're looking forward to all that. I mean, we can't wait for new music. We're enjoying the new music that you're putting out now. Uh, first of all, from us, I want to say congratulations, not just on your success uh, in the music industry, but as being a father and going away and raising a successful son. Obviously, that's something that is a little bit higher in the in the world to be a father and uh, be there for your kid is a big deal. So congratulations on that. Cause uh, as a father, I know how hard it is and you know what I mean? You never really have it figured out, but um, some people being able to see someone like you, that's done it and it gives me hope. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's uh, um, you know, at some point you'll, you'll realize that, Oh shit, I guess I'm sticking around. 
Now what? You know? <laughs> right. what I mean? Yeah. Um, I like to joke that I'm a, a th- that I'm a member of the You Suck at Suicide Club. Yeah. And uh, you know, I I know a lot of us are. So yeah, man, it's 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 been a real fucking journey, and I'm um happy and excited with what's going on now. And uh, I appreciate you in 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 saying that. Yeah. And also, I wanted to give y'all a shout out. I I've been checking out your other episodes. I like what you guys are doing. And I like that you have a real love and passion for the craft of it, you know, for the lyricism of it. Um, it, it's, it's good to see other people doing it. What you're doing is for the passion of it, not for a buck. I, I hope that y'all get to, you know, get to a point to where you can eat off of it. Mm. Like all of us, yeah. like, uh, you know, we're definitely in an age where we can all have our hobbies and make them public, but I hope you guys get to a point to where you can eat off of it as well. Thank you so much. We appreciate that, man. That that means a lot coming from you for sure. Um, And we appreciate everything that you've given to the industry and given to us and being able to listen to you as a youngster and then coming up and seeing that you made it now and uh, and everything that you've accomplished. And then now we get to watch the second phase of your life. We're super stoked for it. Can't wait for it, man. Thank you for joining us on our Halloween episode. And we hope to talk to you again very soon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Hey, before yeah. before we go, Loki, uh, this is our Halloween episode. Favorite horror flick of all time? Do you got one? The Thing. John Carpenter's yeah. The Thing. That, Hands down. That's a fucking classic, That's bro. a killer. That's a killer. The Kurt it's, Russell, it's huh? It's not even, like, I don't have to think about it. There's a lot of, like, a, a, it's spooky season, so I've been watching a lot of shit. But John, Carpenter, John Carpenter's The Thing. Yeah. I saw that at a very impressionable age, and it fucking twisted my wig back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the practical effects are still like people look at it now and that it's not CGI, but the practical effects are horrifying. The paranoia of it, the whole ending where you're not sure, Oh shit, is the thing still there? Mm. Like that is a masterpiece. And I got to take my kid to see it a couple of Halloweens ago in San Diego. It, it was showing out of place. And I got to watch him have that same experience That's where he dope. was like, Holy shit. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, that's dope. And Carpenter was doing the scores too to the movies. You know, Carpenter, like- dude, Carpenter is an unsung hero. Like he, he, he's also one of those guys that frustrates me because the thing is amazing. Halloween is amazing. Escape from New York is amazing. Escape from L.A. is terrible. Yeah. Ghost from oh, Mars man. is pain. I didn't even finish Ghost to Mar- Go- Ghost from Mars. Yeah, and it had Ice Cube in it. Like it was just. Yeah. He's one of those guys that when he fucking nails it, it's so good. Mm. And unfortunately, he's in an industry where um, the level of your success is your last successful movie. And he had a couple back to back ones that didn't do well. But yeah, his, you know, his, you know, he goes on tour with his son. Like he does fucking tours where he plays all of his music from his movies and new shit. Yeah, I've seen this. I've heard of this at least. That's an, yeah. that's an amazing idea. That's a, that's a whole nother yeah. career for him. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, in, and I, I can't forget, um, they live is probably one of the best movies oh, ever. Oh, man. Rowdy Roddy Piper. I mean, Rowdy geez, Roddy come Piper on now. With that glorious 10-minute insane fight scene Ooh. with um, <laughs> Keith David. Yes. That, no, Keith it went on forever. It seemed, it seemed to be never-ending, that fight scene. But I got that poster on my wall. That's one of my favorites as well. I used to walk around saying, of, of come here to kick ass and chew bubblegum. And I'm all out of bubble gum. There you go. Hell yeah. yeah. Well, Loki, we appreciate your time on this Friday night. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us. You're a very gracious man, and we hope to talk to you again in the future and look forward to hearing all that new work that you're about to put in. Absolutely. Hell yeah. Everybody give it up for the one and only. It's Loki. Hell yeah. Salute. Peace. And happy spooky season. Hey, thank you very much, sir. All right, then. Peace, man. I got these motherfucking Rottweilers chained up in the backyard. I'm harder than 80 proof to steal. High on kills, doing what the fuck I must and what I will. Plus, I'ma get like murderous when I spit and cuss. And smoke all your dank till the sack is dust. Now what the fuck they stuck on? These other folks whooping on. Who can loaf the most and get they fuck on? Seems these niggas ain't heard my flow. Thus I'm a murder mo. Bitch him sees till my clip's empty. And put this on my click. We get more sick than addicted with syphilis and all the venom tricks. Now who that on a lick? Get legitimized. Last motherfucker you gon' see is rigor mortis grip to buy. Then I'm out. Shadow like assassin. Forever blasting. Ghetto blaster. And Jackie. <laughs>